good job week in and week out and I'm so grateful for our musicians and our choir leader and, and certainly all the singers as well. Well, I hope your new year is off to a good start. Ours is. Karen and I had a pretty quiet evening on New Year's Eve, just kind of stayed around the house and um, enjoyed, uh, well, we, she went to bed about 9, I went about 10, but, um, so we didn't really see the new year in, but it was good. Sometimes it's, it's good to slow down a little bit, and New Year's Day, we definitely did that. We didn't find uh, time to, to go and do and get our jobs done, but just spent some time being and thinking about where we had been with God and where God might be leading us in the coming year. So our new year got off to a very nice start, way better than a new year we had a, a few years back. That New Year's Eve, after spending some fun down at the Kima Boardwalk in the afternoon with our daughter Elizabeth, her husband Wally, and their two children, just after dark, I would say, we, we headed back to our house where we were catching up with our other daughter, Emily, her husband Blake, and their two boys. When we pulled into the driveway, Blake was there with the boys and their two dogs. He was trying to let the dogs run a little bit, do what they needed to do before they got locked up in the garage for several hours. To keep things simple, we decided we were going to order pizza uh, for dinner, so Several minutes later, I walked out the front door toward my truck. I stopped in the front yard, though, for just a, a few minutes to talk to Blake before I was leaving. One of his dogs, a cute little miniature Australian shepherd named Junior, was racing and darting all over the place, just going crazy. He ran away into the side yard, around the side of the house, all the way to the back fence until our neighbor's very large Rottweiler named Kong started barking, just about jumped through the fence to get him. Little Junior ran back into the front yard around the house just about as fast as he'd ever run before. Junior obviously was not home. He wasn't safely fenced inside his own backyard, didn't know his surroundings. He was going places he shouldn't go. He was doing things he shouldn't do. Not only was there this big dog next door, appropriately named Kong, who could eat him alive, there were cars in the streets, there was a highway a few blocks away. It was dangerous, but Blake was doing his very best to keep his little dog safe. Junior was right next to Blake a couple minutes later when I walked to my truck and got in and started it up. Then as I began to drive slowly out of the driveway, Blake knelt down reached out to take a hold of Junior to keep him from harm's way. But Junior darted away from Blake. He called to him, Blake called to him, told him to come back, but he kept running. He ran right under my truck, under one of the back tires. I felt the back of the truck bounce up. We all heard the yelp. And then Junior died. I felt horrible. It was a sad evening for everyone. It carried over into the next day. It was a terrible way to start a new year. Junior was a good dog. He was fun. The kids loved him. He was with us one minute, and he was gone the next. Things would have been very different if that little dog had not decided to run the other way when his master was reaching out to him. Blake was so good to that dog. He fed him, he played with him, took him to the vet, whatever he needed. If only Junior hadn't run away. If only he would have turned around when his master called. Things would have been very different. You know, God has been reaching out to humans, calling to us ever since creation. God is constantly reaching out to us. It's not as if God lives in some distant, faraway place, high above the clouds, separate. God is always reaching out to us, always calling to us. And when we let him, he always works for good in our lives. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, God reaches out to us every moment of every day in an effort to draw us closer to himself so he can work for good in our lives. 
Our Bible reading this morning offers an example of this. And it tells of the way some people responded when God reached out to them. I'll be reading from the Gospel of Matthew. I invite you to stand as you're able now. I'll be reading Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. <clears throat> After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the territory of Judea, during the rule of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. They asked, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east, and we've come to honor him. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled, and everyone in Jerusalem was troubled with him. He gathered all the chief priests and the legal experts and asked them where the Christ was to be born. They said, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what the prophet wrote. You, Bethlehem, land of Judah, by no means are you least among the rulers of Judah. Because from you will come one who governs, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and found out from them the time when the star had first appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search carefully for the child. When you've found him, report to me, so that I too may go and honor him. When they heard the king, they went. And look, the star they'd seen in the east went ahead of them until it stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother. Falling to their knees, they honored him. Then they opened their treasure chests and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Because they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went back to their own country by another route. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. There's a lot of mystery around the Magi, the wise men who were searching for Jesus. No one knows for sure exactly where they came from. No one knows how many of them there were. We sing about we three kings, right? But that, the Bible doesn't say that. That's just in the song. And it's maybe because there were three gifts. But no one really knows how many there were. No one knows how they found out about Jesus' birth. They followed a star, but how they knew exactly what that star meant and who it was leading them to is a mystery. What we do know is that the Magi were searching for the newborn king of the Jews. We know they wanted to find him so they could honor him. We know they were filled with joy when they finally arrived. We know they fell to their knees to worship him. We know they opened their treasure chests to give him valuable gifts, the best they had to offer. And we know, we can be sure, the Magi made their long journey in search of this newborn king because God reached out to them. In some way, God spoke to them. God touched their hearts. God did something to draw them to his son. That's what God does. <laughs> it's part of who God is. God is constantly reaching out to all people everywhere so we can find life in his son. God begins this work not when we're a little baby like the one we hear out here, which I'm not complaining about. I'm glad the baby's here. We, God begins to work not when we're a little baby, but at the very moment life begins. We don't have to ask for it. We certainly don't have to earn it. God reaches out to us, calling us to his son before we've even heard of him. Because God wants us to experience life the way it's intended to be. This is what we call grace. God loves us and wants us to live with him forever. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, called this particular kind of grace provenient grace. God at work to draw all people to himself. God wants this for us more than anything else. And deep down, we all want it for ourselves. We long for it. We hunger for it. But in this broken world, we can get distracted. 
Our longings can get misdirected. We often try to satisfy our deepest desires in ways that lead us away from God and living the life that he intends, the life we truly want. An author and a pastor named John Burke talks about this in one of his books. It's called Soul Revolution. He says we all have strategies for quenching our deepest desires. For some people, this strategy is to find Mr. or Mrs. Wright and to get married and to have a loving family. But marriage doesn't guarantee love. It doesn't guarantee faithfulness or security. Finding the right partner and having a family is a good thing, a very good thing. But marriage alone can't give us everything our souls hunger for. It cannot satisfy all of our spiritual needs. For some people, the strategy is to reach a certain financial level, a certain career, maybe a particular lifestyle goal. You might call this material success. Material success in and of itself is not a bad thing, but it alone will never be enough. Money, status, travel, big boy and big girl toys are very appealing. They can be fun. But they don't provide contentment. They don't provide true happiness. They're usually just distractions from the true longings of our souls for things like fulfillment and purpose. And they tend to get in the way of our desire to be generous and compassionate. If we spend everything on ourselves, focus only on ourselves, we don't have anything left to help the needy. For some people who've been deeply wounded, the strategy is to become self-sufficient, strong, independent, to have no need of anyone. But a person can't find inner peace or strength on his or her own. Only God can provide them. And you'll never overcome fear of living in a dangerous world if you try to live completely alone. Another strategy for quenching the deep desires of the soul that um, many people uh, seek today is to live for the next extreme rush, right? Instant gratification purchases, short-term thrills, one-night stands, sexual highs, chemically dependent, and uninhibited pleasure. All of these make some people feel alive for a moment, but they ultimately move people further away from the life they seek. And at some point, these thrills, the highs, end up leaving people very, very low and empty and depressed and lost. There's only one way to satisfy the deepest longing of your soul. There's only one way you can find enduring spiritual qualities like excitement with inner peace, adventure with lasting security, lifelong intimacy, and sexual contentment. And that one way is through obedience to God who's reaching out to you and calling to you so he can give you what you truly long for. According to the great Christian author C.S. Lewis, the problem is not that we want too much. The problem is we settle for too little. You ever think about it? You don't want too much when you're moving away from God. If you're moving away from God, you're settling for too little. And we do this by deceiving ourselves in a couple of ways. First, we believe our strategies will work, that we can figure this out for ourselves. <laughs> and the other way we uh, fool ourselves is we believe that God will get in the way of what we truly desire. On our own, we get this exactly backwards. We cannot figure it out on our own. And God will never get in our way because God is the only way. Our deepest longing, sewn into the fabric of who we are as human beings, is to experience and express the love 
of the greatest, most beautiful, most powerful, caring being that exists. You and I were created by God in God's image to experience and express his love. So nothing else will satisfy us. Nothing else, because God has hardwired us for this. To love like him and to live with him forever. Just as geese are are hardwired to fly south in the wintertime, we are hardwired for God, to seek God. So you'll never find a life that you truly desire without God because he is and he alone offers everything you desire most everything anything other than God then falls short anything other than God is shallow anything other than God anything at all is destructive and at some point we all learn this unfortunately too many of us have to learn this the hard way I'd like you to listen to a story about Brian. The night was a blur as he sped home. Flashes of drinks and flirting and more drinks, which made it easier for him to be funny in front of her, just kept flying through his mind. As he sped up a big hill, Brian knew that he shouldn't be driving in that condition, much less speeding. But he was, he was on top of the world. He flew past all these other cars telling himself, you know what, I am going to ask her out. He crested the top of the hill and he looked back in his rearview mirror at all the lights behind him, thinking of all those wimpy, slow drivers that he had just passed. Then he saw the flashing lights. Then he heard the siren. It was Brian's third DWI. This one was a felony. After a night in jail, An alcohol assessment and meeting with lawyers, Brian heard the news. It's not good, Brian, the counselor began. Three DWIs, public intoxication, drinking five or more drinks on an average night, a high blood alcohol level and a family history of alcoholism. This is serious. You seem like an intelligent guy. You have a degree, you own your own architecture firm. But you really abuse this stuff. The counselor explained all the hoops Brian was going to have to jump through. Alcohol awareness classes, Mothers Against Drunk Driver forums, community service, and Alcoholics Anonymous. He was going to have to go to 28 meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. At his first meeting, Brian admitted to himself that he was afraid. Afraid to find out what was behind all his feelings of shame. And he felt guilty and alone as he sat there in a cold metal chair. While other people were filing into the room, Brian saw a poster on the wall. wall. He read the first few lines on that poster. Uh, Number one said, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Number two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Then number three, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. What Brian thought after he read those first three steps, I'm here to go through this stuff. I don't have a problem and I certainly don't need God. My my counselor didn't tell me she was sending me to church. Brian had been living for pleasure since the age of 16. He didn't think he needed God. He didn't think he needed religion. And the choices he made, he now admits, led him to become a workaholic, an abuser of alcohol who was sexually obsessed, and ultimately a lonely, bored, empty man. Well, Brian survived his first AA meeting. And on his way out, someone handed him a copy of what they call the big book. And he said, you only hit rock bottom when bad things happen faster than you can lower your standards. Brian laughed at the time, but later those words started to haunt him. 
as he thought about how often he justified his bad behavior by lowering his standards. Sometime later, Brian opened the big book and he began to read about the life of one of AA's co-founders, Bill Wilson. And suddenly Brian read something that got his attention. It said, I've begun to know happiness, peace, and usefulness in a way of life that's incredibly more wonderful as time passes. Happiness and peace, those were foreign concepts to Brian. His days were monotonous and boring and aggravating. He always felt like he needed something crazy and exciting just to get a temporary buzz. He was not in any way happy. So he read on in the big book and eventually became convinced that he needed to give God a try. He got started one night as he lay in bed. God, he said, I don't even know if you're there. I don't even know if you exist, but thank you. Brian thanked God for something good that happened that day. For the next few months, Brian kept reviewing his life, the good things and the bad things at the end of the day as he lay in bed and he thanked God for all the good things that he remembered. And even though he wasn't sure God was there, something began to change in his heart. Eventually, his nightly connection with God turned into multiple connections with God throughout the day, and soon he knew God was there. He saw God at work in so many ways. It transformed him into a person who who was a person of faith, a person who was truly pursuing the Christian life. And that gave Brian a whole new outlook on life. He now has a new energy, new friends, very important, new friends, and he has a sense of purpose. He says his life is not perfect or trouble-free, but for the first time, Thanks to his new strategy for satisfying the deepest desires of his soul, he knows happiness and peace as a way of life, and he never feels alone anymore. What's your strategy for satisfying the deepest longings of your soul? My strategy, I think you'll recognize it, is to worship, grow, and serve. I believe worshiping God with other believers as often as I can, growing spiritually through personal devotional time and through small group time, and through serving others in Jesus' name. I believe through worship, growing spiritually, and through Christian service that I'm able to connect with the God who's reaching out to me. And I believe the same thing is true for you. Don't turn and run when God reaches out to you. The way Junior, that miniature Australian shepherd, turned and ran from my son-in-law, Blake. Don't turn and run. Far better example to follow would be the wise man. Go where God leads. Do whatever it takes to find his son. So you can find joy and peace in his presence. So you can give him the honor he's due in worship. So you can give him gifts. The very best you have to offer. When you do, you'll be living the life. Living the life you truly desire, living the life you were created to live, living the life that's far better than anything you could ever find on your own. Amen.